Pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment, though. Thank you. 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 The 5th grader pageant participants will be in the most revered homeroom today. Mr. Rader needs to attend the meeting also. There will be important information when it goes out. Students, if you're entering school enrollment, there's a parent meeting tonight at 5 p.m. You and your parent must attend there if you haven't did it before last week to be able to do your enrollment. And we'll take our test. Right. We are missing everyone quite here. What's going on? Ninth graders, is it ninth grade skip day? Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll take attendance at our bathroom break. So I'll make sure we're all set up before we get going. Let me give you this for starters. Uh, we got a power pack couple weeks coming at us. All right, we're sliding towards two more exams. One exam ends with World War II. So we're going to have World War I, World War II, two big events in world history. The next exam is going to be what we call the modern era, World War II, kind of into the present. That's a whole lot of stuff to talk about, and no, we can't hit every little bit of it. But we're going to hit some things uh, rather quickly. We're going to hit some things in a Unit 5 that will set you up for U.S. history. So no need to wrap your brain around all that just yet. I'm just letting you know. We've still got two more units, unit exams happening. We're on that fast slide at the end of the year as well. This class, of course, does not have an EOC, but you do have a final exam, which is exemptable based on your absences. So that's, you know, if you've been here all semester, you may exempt that. If not, you will have a comprehensive 30 question, all the information, Mesopotamia, up to Barack Obama uh, type, of, type, of, type of an exam. Of course, I'll have to study that or whatever. So I'm just telling you, those of you that maybe think that April is the day, the time to start missing class, or oh, I don't need to be here anymore, I'm good, I'm a great. Be here for me. All right, we're still pushing. We're still running pretty fast. So uh, I know everyone's got individual circumstances. I'm not dogging on anyone's absence. But I'm saying if it's like I should come to school, or I shouldn't come to school today, then you should definitely come to school today. All right? Obviously, I'm preaching to the choir, those of you that are here. Uh, you should have two pages in front of you World War I notes. Everybody got it? And if uh, you don't, and there happens to be one just next to you, you can grab it. And then the other one, Isaac was helping me out. This is a Full color page printout kind of looks like a comic strip. Everybody got this guy? Mm -hmm. All right, you should have two pages for the day. And per the use, I got extras for those that are absent and otherwise. I want to real quickly recognize Miss Thea. Thea was selected as a student of the month, but Thea was absent on the day that they gave the rewards, which is a blizzard from Dairy Queen. And Thea, ever so kindly, right? It's random acts of kindness go a long way. Ever so kindly, did they call you? Something like that? She said, I know I'm absent today, but just go ahead and give my blizzard to Mr. Swanson. He's a, he's the teacher of the month. I was like, hoo, hoo, hoo. I melted on the inside, and then I ate a frosty, and I got all cold on the inside. No. So, Thea, I want to say thank you. That was so super awesome. kind of you. Super kind of you. And will you come up? Will you be recognized as student of the month? In my prize locker, I usually do these for tests, but, Thea, I'll let you choose one. You got both army you got bandanas. Up. Black and gold or gray and, gray and uh, blue, whichever you choose. <laughs> she wants you to vote. Gold. Black. Gold. Black. Gold. Black. Gold. A lot of students like the black and gold one. It tends to be a little bit bigger. Hey, Thea, student of the month. <laughs> student of the month. So, hey, uh, we talk a lot about walking the Raider Ray, Ray Way, being recognized for excellence, all that kind of stuff. I'm proud of Thea. She's kind. She's kind hearted. She was the student of the month. She wasn't here for her reward, so I thought I could help her out. All right, before we get started on World War One, World War One, World War One is a plenty big topic, and we're going to be diving into it. If you have some questions as to what's in front of you here today, good. You should have those questions, and I will explain how you're going to participate in today's class. But first, to be serious with me for a second, on this day in history, April 19, 1995. Big day in our country's history, big day in the Swanson family history. On this day, the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City was attacked by the American terrorist, Timothy McVeigh. He targeted this building because it was a federal structure. He targeted this building because he was hoping to start a grassroots war against the federal government. 
Also, he had a little bit of a tinge of a racial motivation. He was hoping to start a race war uh, as well. So very sick and twisted individual. He was arrested for his crime. He was executed about five years after the crime. That's kind of how the story ends for him. But this is what that day looked like in Oklahoma City. I'll tell you ever so briefly my personal story, my family story. Um, uh, and I, I will try, I kind of tell this story on a two-year cycle. I can't always give a whole class period to it, but since it's this day in history, I'm going to give you a little bit of it. This is the Swanson family in 1995. Bedroom. No, that's, I'm Bo right. I guess I got cut out of that bedroom. No. Swanson family in 1995. <laughs> this is not that exact day, but this is our family in 1995. I've got two brothers. There's three of us total. In this picture, my mom is pregnant with my youngest brother, which is exactly what was the case on April 19, 1995. April 19, 1995, in the morning, 8.55 or so, she gets on the phone with my dad. My dad works in downtown Oklahoma City, which is actually just two blocks south of this building right here. So he was very close to the blacks, two blocks south of it. Um, they're on the phone together. They're talking about the day. Actually, on that day, she was going to go for an ultrasound to see the baby with the ultrasound. So they're just talking the details about that. Hard for us to think about, hard for you to understand. They didn't have phone, they didn't have cell phones. They couldn't just text each other the address. People actually had to make make up plans to meet together at this address at this time. And, you know, you couldn't just text someone if that was going to change. So they're on the phone. They're talking to each other. Nine o'clock, nine o one, at nine o two. From the phone, my mom hears the bomb go off. 9.02 a.m. is when the world changed forever, especially changed in Oklahoma City. That's when the bomb went off. So my mom hears the phone, or my mom hears the blast from the phone. My dad, he's Mr. Cool Guy, because that's what he was, young professional. He was like happening in his office. He had his feet kicked up on his desk, right, kind of leaned back in his chair. And because of such, the blast came from behind him, and it threw him across the room. Now, if you want to get into uh, miracles and God, if he hadn't been thrown across the room, well, his window pane came in crashing behind him. If he hadn't been thrown across the room, that window pane probably would have crushed him. He probably would have been one of the farthest out casualties. Being two blocks away, a lot of people experienced the blast, but not many people were hurt or killed outside of the building. But two blocks away, my dad might have been one of the farthest out casualties, injured or even dead. If he hadn't flown across the room. So that's part of our family story is that he had his feet up on the desk and he flew across the room. My mom stays on the phone for eight minutes. This is back in the day where there was something called call waiting. I know you guys don't even understand that at all. But my dad found another phone, another landline phone. He dialed in, and while she's on the phone and she's hearing the chaos, she starts she, first she hears the blast, she hears some screaming, she hears my dad's voice, and of course she doesn't know what's going on. Clearly, there's some chaos. And uh, finally he finds another phone, he dials in. And when you're on a phone like this, it would go beep, 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 beep. And that would mean you have another call. I know you guys are like looking at your phone and your FaceTime and your Facebook and all at the same time. The call waiting was just beep, beep. So she punched the little star button, I think it was, to, to go over to the other line. Sure enough, it's him. He says, Carol, I don't know exactly what just happened, but a bomb went off downtown. Turn on the TV. I'll call you when I can. So I was in first grade in, on that day. And I was at home because I was going to go to the ultrasound. Normally, I would have been at school, but I was going to go to the doctor's office, see my little baby brother on the ultrasound screen. So we turn on the TV, and I distinctly remember turning on the news television, and the news helicopters are on the scene very fast, very rapidly, and this is the scene that we see. So I, I can tell you, you know, the story at length, but what, uh, what happened on that day is that 168 individuals were killed. We can talk about history. We can talk about something that's in a textbook. We can talk about you got to memorize this because it's on the test, right? We talk about that a lot. I hope that we'll never forget that there's actually people involved in the stories that we're telling. There's people involved. When we talk about war and death and numbers, there's actually people involved. And in Oklahoma City, 168 people were killed on that day in that moment. Uh, one of them was a nurse who actually was responding to the event. Like she came to help, and she was hit with falling debris later in the day. So in total, 168 people, men, women. The nurse and children. There's actually a daycare in the building, and the daycare was hit very hard. So very young children were killed on this day as well. Since it's this day in history, and I know we got academics to get to, but since it's this day in history, I'm going to show you a brief, like, four-minute clip, kind of from the History Channel perspective. It's a very good video, and should you have questions afterwards, should you have questions, I will, uh, I'll be happy to tell you my story and tell you the whole story. we got to get to class, right? We're going to get to class. I can't give a whole class period to Oklahoma City today. 
But if you got questions or you want to know more about it, I'd be happy to answer some questions. One of my favorite things that a student said last year when I told this story, and she said, how come nobody's ever told me about this before? So I recognize that we're in Georgia. It's not Oklahoma City. Today in Oklahoma City, schools are going to remember. They're probably put on the remembrance ceremony. This is the 27th anniversary. A lot of kids that are in school today, obviously none of them were born, but many of them had parents kind of my age, first grade when it happened. So it's a story that gets told in Oklahoma City. I know that in Georgia, it's not quite as uh, common of a story to tell, which is why you have your teacher telling it to you. But it was horrific. Yeah. And, and we and felt it. From across the country. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Your perspective. Um, we felt it then in school when it all happened. I mean, we were like, seriously, this can happen. Um, and it was kind of like a wake-up moment for us, even though it was so far away in Oklahoma. Um, you know, it's just something you don't want to forget. It's something that's it's pretty rough. So, it was like 9-11, you know. That was, that was intense, and you knew it could happen at any moment, at any time, and any place. Same thing with this as well. Very difficult to understand that it was an American who attacked the American building. Right? It's one thing for us to consider foreign right. attackers or a military waging war, but this was an American terrorist. We don't often use that word. An American terrorist. He was uh, doing crimes against civilians for political gain. That's the definition of a terrorist. So, well, he did the bomb. So I'm going to show you this video to probably answer some of your questions. Obviously, there's a lot to the story. There's a beautiful memorial in Oklahoma City to this day. I'd be happy to answer some questions. I can't give a whole hour to it. But here's this quick video. On April 19, 1995, Timothy McVeigh, an American Gulf War veteran, shocked America when he committed what was at that time the most devastating terrorist attack on American soil. This is the story of the Oklahoma City bombing. On April 19, 1995, a rental truck filled with homemade explosives detonated outside the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. The blast caused catastrophic damage, leaving 168 people dead and hundreds more injured. The question on nearly everyone's mind was, why? What motive could someone have to blow up a building and one that included a daycare center. Two men, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, were ultimately held responsible for the bombing at Oklahoma City. Both McVeigh and Nichols served in the military and met in basic training at Fort Benning in 1988. Georgia. That same year, McVeigh became a candidate for the Special Forces, but dropped out after just two days. He later reunited with Nichols. They bonded over their mutual anti-government sentiments. McVeigh's distrust of the government began in high school. As a teenager, he read the Turner Diaries by William Pierce, the leader of one of America's most prominent neo-Nazi organizations at the time. The book outlines a fictional Aryan revolution against the federal government, and its opening scene is eerily similar to the Oklahoma City bombing. A truck exploded outside a government building. By 1994, McVeigh and Nichols' hatred and distrust of the government had been further fueled by events like the FBI assault on the Branch Davidian compound, home to a religious cult in Waco, Texas. In September of 1994, McVeigh and Nichols began plotting to destroy a federal symbol. They chose the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in downtown Oklahoma City. On the morning of April 19, 1995, McVeigh parked a rental truck filled with homemade explosives outside the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building. At 9.02 a.m., he detonated the bomb. Get up, get up. The blast destroyed nearly half of the building, collapsing its entire north wall. It also left a 16-block radius of destruction. Nearly 300 buildings in the immediate area were damaged including the Journal Record Building, five blocks away. 25 buildings were completely destroyed. 850 people were injured, many in the surrounding area, including 39 people at the Water Resources Board Building, one block north of the explosion. 168 people were killed, 19 were children. More than a third of the population of Oklahoma City knew someone who was a victim the attack. For an attack on a scale America had never before seen, 
it required a response that was perhaps never thought needed. In the aftermath, 12,384 people volunteered in rescue and recovery efforts. 16 different organizations, ranging from FEMA to the IRS, established volunteer areas at the Recovery Service Center. From every corner of America, people responded, said Larry Mackey, the lawyer for the prosecution. Rescuers from across this country descended on Oklahoma City. Literally hundreds and hundreds of law enforcement officers got in their cars, caught planes, and headed to downtown Oklahoma City. America was in shock. People needed help. McVeigh and Nichols were arrested. In the summer of 1997, McVeigh was tried and convicted on 11 different counts and sentenced to death. He was executed by lethal injection on June 11, 2001. Nichols was found guilty on one count of conspiracy and eight counts of involuntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to life in prison. In 2004, he was tried again on state charges in Oklahoma and convicted of 161 counts of first-degree murder, including fetal homicide. He received 161 consecutive life terms in prison. Today, the Oklahoma National Memorial This is where the site is today. Those who lost their lives and the survivors of this horrific attack. Even decades later, Americans still try to find rationale and reason, an explanation for acts of senseless terror, and hope that they will never happen again. Yeah, so uh, very good video. I want you to focus on the portion of the video that was called the aftermath. I think, what did it say? It said the men, the uh, the bombing, and the aftermath. The aftermath is the story of Oklahoma City that I love. Over the wire and through the telephone, there you're seeing more pictures of the Burr Federal Building. And the, uh, the aftermath is the story of Oklahoma City that I love the most, uh, having grown up there. You see, the t-shirt I'm wearing today says Oklahoma Standard. Actually got this at the memorial in the Memorial Museum. The last couple pictures you saw there with some nice glowing lights. What the memorial is today, it's a 168 chairs. They are empty. They represent the 168 lives that were lost. Adult chairs are large. Child chairs, there's a special chair that represents the 19 children. It's smaller. It's a very powerful place to visit. Should you ever pass to Oklahoma City for any reason, we just absolutely recommend stopping at the Oklahoma City National Memorial. And you can see uh, the story uh, for, for, for yourself. You can see how it unfolded, where it unfolded. Anyhow, the Oklahoma Standard references the, the response and the aftermath. The way that the country united, the way that Oklahoma City united around its, itself, its people, and the way that the country united around Oklahoma City kind of became a standard for how to do disaster relief. It became a standard for uh, outside agencies coming in to help. It became known as the Oklahoma standard. It is said that people were so kind in Oklahoma, so welcoming, so grateful for the help, that there's a story that the governor of Oklahoma at the time tells about the Oklahoma dollar. He said that he was at an event with some firefighters, some rescue workers that had come in from out of state. He was obviously thanking them. He's saying, thank you for coming and helping in our time of need. And a man stood up and he held up a dollar, dollar bill. And he said, Mr. Governor, do you know what this is? Governor, I, I, don't, I don't know, tell me. He said, this is an Oklahoma dollar. This is a dollar that I came here with in my pocket, and I have been unable to spend it this whole time because everything I've, been, I've needed has been provided. Nobody will take my money. They're so grateful for what we're doing here. This is an Oklahoma dollar. You can't spend it. Point is that people in Oklahoma were so grateful and so helpful, it became known as the Oklahoma Standard. And unfortunately, we never knew that this would be the case, but fast forward 10 years, six years to 2001 in New York City after 9-11, same thing happened. We saw the same type of uniting. We saw the same type of disaster relief. This time, people from Oklahoma City went to New York City to help a sister city uh, in need. So I, my favorite part of the story is not the tragedy. It's certainly not the bad guys, right? I don't like talking about the bad guys. They're not worth even talking about. They're done. They're out of history. But I love the story of the response and how Oklahoma City, though hurt, got stronger, has gotten stronger in the past 27 years. So these days, there's a beautiful memorial there. There's a museum that focuses on the whole story. It's got some very interesting artifacts about the crime itself, but it really focuses on the story of the people 
people who died and the people who uh, gave of their time and their efforts in the rescue effort. The museum is very beautiful. And then something Oklahoma City does that is also very kind of foundational to my family's life. And, and, and when I lived in Oklahoma City, it's something we did every year. We started a marathon, a 26.2 mile running marathon for the Oklahoma City National uh, Memorial Marathon, Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon. And it's not a famous marathon. It's not one with a bunch of money. It's not like the Boston Marathon. It's not like the Olympics. But what it is is where people can come, kind of struggle through a race, right? Anytime you run a marathon, no matter how good, how, how fit or unfit you are, it's a struggle to get through 26 miles. And it kind of it references, it's about the struggle and the healing that has come to the, to the city. The marathon started off with a couple thousand people, and that's a good number. Today, it's grown to over 40,000 participants. Everything from a 5K to a full marathon, even the kids run. So Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon is a pretty important part of the healing. Uh, my family story, my dad is a chairman for the race. He's part of the planning committee. I got a couple medals over there uh, from when I've been able to run it. Haven't been able to get back every single year ever since. But a pretty cool part of how Oklahoma City has healed. At this point, I've gone on a little longer than I intended to, but I'll tell you two more things. This is an actual piece of the building. This is a piece of the Murrah Federal Building. And uh, the reason I was able to get it is my dad was able to get it due to his proximity to the blast. He didn't get it on that day. But afterwards, there was so much rubble to pick up. And people were keenly aware of the history. So uh, many pieces of the building got shared kind of as mementos or just I carry it here to tell you the story. So I'm going to pass this around. This is an actual piece of the building. I just as, as I pass artifacts, I want you to connect with history, but I should be respectful and kind of what I have in the room. So start that with Mimi and just pass it along when you're done. And then finally, I'll end with this final representation. This is a, uh, this, is a rep, this is a replica. I got this at the museum. But this is the Oklahoma City Fire Department. This is their hat. This is their logo. This is what I think about as the good guys. All right, I got this hat. Here, have it in the room. It's heavy, isn't it? It's heavy. It's hefty for a little piece. So imagine chunks of that flying through the air. That's what happened in the blast. Anyway, Oklahoma City Fire Department. These are the good guys. This is what I think about as the rescuers, the helpers. <clears throat> Mr. Rogers, I'll close with this. Mr. Rogers has a quote. He said that his mother told him that anytime there's something that bad that happens, look for the helpers. You'll always find people running to help. So anytime there is bad and tragedy, that's what I like to look for. I like to look for the helpers. And in Oklahoma City, in April, on April 19th, 1995, we saw a lot of helpers uh, uh, in, in the city on that day. So uh, I hope I brought you a nugget of knowledge maybe you didn't know about before. Uh, we're, we're a half step before a bathroom break, but we're going to go ahead and go now so that we can push through World War One when we get back. Uh, as you're passing around the rock, just actually don't drop it. It probably will break your toe. And, uh, yeah, take your break, and we'll come on back. <laughs> Hey man, hey, that was me. I'm good. But I'm getting it. Was this the only paper from yesterday? Uh, it was. I basically said I did your notes for you. I can never tell the difference between the case. That's not true. Yes, it is. Pepsi, it's pretty strong. Are you all not taking a break? Catching up on papers? Um, Say, this is our break. If you need a break, take it. Uh, right? You don't want to do some dollars. Do I have enough? Yesterday, that was the notes. I said, basically, I did the notes for you. Uh, so you're welcome. That's the class. That's the classic text. Yeah, so they, I know it sounds maybe like souvenir hunting. Big old chunks of rock would just get left in their parking garage, and it was kind of like souvenirs a little bit. You know, it's like if you were part of the experience, you know, this is a big part of your life, you take a little nugget with you. How about why you sitting right there? You know, I have to the answer. Look back on it. Yeah, so I got a Taylor's book. I got Hawaii sitting next to Oklahoma City. 
sit next to the DMV. That's, that's pretty, like, those three artifacts are traveling pretty far sitting next to each other. Um, you gotta put it on a flat edge thing. Yeah. Please do. I mean, that's the only way I have. I haven't visited Korea. I've visited the other two, but yeah, I love more stuff. Please, anything you see that's relevant, even like the peanut butter brochure, right? Okay. That's the simple stuff. I would love to have that. Well, what is the green one? Maybe have the green stuff, but I don't know where it is. And especially, like, if you have the legs for a month, we'll put them in. Awesome. But, so whatever you see there, even if it's on our class content, I'm still love to have the history inside of it. Yeah, anything. Anything would be wonderful. You know how we do, it's musty in here, and then it's musty in here. Yes. I don't know, that feel like it's you. You think it's me? I'm just kidding. All right, so I'll close, uh, I'll transition with one more thing. I don't know if you guys ever noticed, but I try to post the poster of the week outside. I collect a lot of pamphlets, brochures, various uh, historical sites I go to, and this week's poster of the week is from the Oklahoma City National Memorial. So I, uh, I got two of them, it's kind of front back, laminated, it takes it out there. So uh, it's outside, it's on the outside of the wall. Uh, so if you want to just kind of read the pamphlet that comes from the Oklahoma City National Memorial, it's on the wall right outside. Uh, I do, uh, I try to change the poster every week. I've done Pearl Harbor, I've done Gettysburg, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to have a touch of more travel and more destinations right here in Alabama, Georgia, this, you can read my pamphlets uh, on a weekly basis. So, here we go with World War One. Now, World War One is characterized by a lot of things, most namely trench warfare. We are going to talk about trench warfare more specifically tomorrow. Today, we're going to talk about the main causes of World War One. Now, I found this picture a while ago. Look at this headline. It says... Instagrammer, age 22, says learning about World War II is bad for kids' mental health. I know it says World War II, but we saw World War One as well. You think learning about wars is bad for someone's mental health? Mm -hmm. No. Nah, he look, he look. Bro, you're just he learning. Yeah, you're just yeah. learning. I like that. It is bad. It looks what? No person insults. Get a glimpse of the past. Okay, yeah. okay. Why would learning about wars be 
good for a person, mental health or otherwise? Why would it be good for a person? So we don't understand what you're going through. I like that. Okay? Yeah, we, we got a pretty really strong I'm response. I like that. I want to give you another headline. Basically, shows the opposite. This says there were no safe spaces or trigger warnings for the young people fighting in the Warsaw uprising. Yeah. Now, Warsaw is an area where the citizens had to protect their own neighborhoods. Not all that different, right? History repeats itself. Not all that different from what we've been talking about in Ukraine all semester long. So sometimes some people need that safe space or trigger warning. I'm not. I'm trying not to belittle anything. But sometimes young people, your age, young people throughout history have had to step up and defend their homeland, defend their neighborhood. Uh, so I would argue that it's better to talk about history and understand it than to shy away from it and be scared of it. So this is something to think about, right? Not all people view history the same, and that Instagrammer maybe is one of them. So just kind of a starting off position for where we're going. World War I, commonly called the Great War. Now, as I flow through my slides here, I've got a several uh, kind of short moving images, GIFs or whatever. So uh, I'll try to always let them show out, but then they're going to repeat and I'll move on. Often called the Great War, often called the War to End All Wars. What did it? What? Well, just the word. No, no. How, how do you know? Because there's a World War Two. Because there's a World War Two. Liam, I love. It. If it's called, if 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 it's called World War One, now we have the benefit of time and history and all that. But we know that there's a World War Two, and certainly we know there's been many wars, large and small, ever since. But here's there's not been a World War Three. Oh, well, I can teach that. Here's something important to understand. As historians, we got to place ourselves in the time period we're studying. The people on these battlefields in World War One, they didn't call it World War One. They didn't give it the label of number one. They didn't know what else was to come. They genuinely believed, genuinely believed they were fighting the war to end all wars. They were going to have one more big battle for all of humankind. We're going to settle out who's the good guys and who's the bad guys. We're going to punish the good guys. Punish the bad guys. The good guys are going to rise to the top, and Jesus is coming back. I don't know. No, they really believed that they were fighting the war to end all wars. Of course, they weren't. But as we watch some of the things that happened in World War One, we got to keep that in mind. They thought that this was the last great battle of all time. So the notes you have in front of you, we're going to talk about the causes of World War One. It is very easy to remember these because historians have given it this perfect little acronym, Maine. The main causes of World War One, and you see the notes in front of you. We're going to go over each of them, but you can fill out M A I N N right now. M is militarism. What's the root word there that you can break military. down? Military. Military. Yeah, militarism related to the military. Alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. So write down the main causes. M A I N N. It's like a good Baptist preacher came up with that one. M A I N N. A four-point sermon. Uh, we're going to go over the main causes of World War I. These are long-term causes. These are four different pillars, different categories of causes that were decades in the making. Not the kind of stuff that happened overnight. Ooh, I got angry at you and I'm going to war. These four causes were a long time in the building. We are then going to talk about, you take your eyes on down your notes, we're going to talk about the immediate cause. We're going to talk about that one thing that just made the world snap. Straw that broke the camel's back, the tipping point, however you want to say it, we're going to talk about the immediate cost. So, building the acronym in your brain, M-A-I-N-I-C, main-I-C, four main causes, and then there's an immediate cause. So, I think you got M-A-I-N-N written down, we're going to go over each one here, militarism. I'm going to spend kind of a lot of time inside of militarism, talk about various technologies, it's fun for me to explain the military to you. Let's talk back and forth. If you got questions or thoughts, we can go with it. We'll spend, we'll spend a little bit of time in militarism. Go, go a little bit faster on the other three, if, uh, if that's okay with you. What's the question? Yeah, what is that? What do we think that is? a tank in the air. It's a tank. That's falling into what? A trench. A trench. Yeah, a trench. So we're going to talk about trench warfare at length. A trench, you know, I'll give you the simple summary so you can even start to understand the picture. A trench is a long line being dug into the ground. Much like today, we have side ditches or runoff trenches. or They were digging these trenches for protection from the shooting from. in order to fight the war. Pretty. Thousands of miles of trench line got dug throughout the war. That's really my big thing tomorrow, but I do want to explain it just enough that you can understand what a trench is. Kevin. 
Oh, yes, the whole war. Took the whole war to dig. So the uh, trenches would start off uh, just kind of a little scratch in the ground, right, just enough to get your body into. They developed into whole living systems. They had hiding holes for sleeping. They had larger cutouts for the officers to spread their maps out and sip their tea. It became a whole network suitable for people to live into. So you drop a little bomb to where those. Yeah. Hang on to trenches for me. Maybe I should have started with it, but if you'll trust my process here, if you'll trust my progress, we're going to be all in the trenches tomorrow. Have. Okay? Militarism. That is a tank. Tank was one of the early technologies. We're going to talk about tanks specifically here in just a second. Uh, don't not quite the tanks you might think of today. Okay? Early attempts of this technology were not quite as efficient as the tanks that we we have today. Here's what you, here's what is militarism, and here's what you need to write down: an arms race between countries and a glorification of war. Having been, having been there, okay, having spent nine months in Afghanistan and I've seen war, I don't think there's anything glorified about it, but that's hard to tell people who haven't been there before. There's this, uh, there's an arms race going on between all these various European kingdoms, monarchs. A lot of them are related kind of at a distant level, third, fourth, and fifth cousins. So it's almost like a competition between extended kin. And if you have new technology, Boys, men, dads, if you get a new tool in the tool shed, ladies for that matter, you got a new, you got a new toy of some sort, whether it's a tool or a fill-in-the-blank thing that you just bought. What do you want to do with it? Use it. Use it, yeah. So part of the arms race was that we're building this, this uh, you know, base of a technology. We have a whole new arsenal. And even though it means killing people, even though going to war means people, you know, bleed and die, they wanted to go test out their equipment. So the uh, arms race leads to the glorification of war. And at that point, if someone gets slapped in the face, you're ready to go to war over it. Okay, so this is a building. This didn't happen overnight. It was a long buildup. Weapons, arsenals, the glorification of war. Some of the background photos fit the category. And then, of course, some of them are also just showing you more things about World War One. So I'll try to explain as we go. You got questions, let me know. A little bit more about militarism. New military technologies came out of this. This arms race was not, we weren't stockpiling bayonets. That's an old technology. We weren't stockpiling smoothbore rifles. That's an old technology. We're getting into the new stuff. Tanks, machine guns, which is a marked change from what we've talked about in the past. In the past, what kind of rifles have we been using? Single shot, smoothbore, showed you videos of the British marching right at each other, packed tightly together. Well, a machine gun, tell me what you know about a machine gun. How many bullets can it fire in fast? Yeah, Aiden went straight for the sound effect. Mm -hmm. Shoot fast. Various machine guns have different rates of fire, but going from three shots a minute, where you have to reload and pack the powder and all that kind of stuff, a to 100 plus aimed shots per minute, yeah. Big difference, big difference. So machine guns are going to change the battlefield. Airplanes. We haven't really talked about the invention of it, but let me just say now we have air power in the world. Starts in America with the Wright brothers in 1903. Well, a short 10 years later, first man flight to using it in war with hundreds, thousands of planes in the sky, new technology. We can do a whole lot of new things with airplanes. We'll talk about them. And then the submarine. Oh, so we have a, we have a war from the sky and war from the, from under the water. Now the battlefield is 360 degrees. Used to be armies marching right at each other, gentlemanly, if you could use that word. Well, now we have a 360-degree battle. Can you take that right with the tension? Yep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Couple pictures here. This shows uh, this shows soldiers just kind of uh, disassembling their weapons, cleaning their weapons. From a military perspective, I'll tell you that the maintenance of your weapon is super important. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't uh, buy a dirt bike and never take care of it, right? Same thing for weapons. You got to take care of them, especially as we'll talk about the trench warfare. The moisture, the dirt, the, uh, the just the grime that was around, you uh, you had to take great care of your weapons. So this is soldiers caring for their weapons. Flamethrower, I'm not going to talk at length about flamethrowers, but uh, is that anybody ever play with a flamethrower on a video game? Yeah. Not real life, Liam, on a video uh, game. He has to, look at that. <laughs> flamethrower is a new technology on the battlefield as well. This is man and man carry. And they were even tank mounted. So flamethrowers are kind of one of the sexier pieces of equipment that comes out of World War One. All right, let's talk about machine guns. Already starting to tell you a little bit about machine guns. I'll advertise. I'll advertise right here that there is a National World War One museum. 
It is in Kansas City, Kansas. I have been there when I lived in Oklahoma. It's easy to drive there. Uh, even if you can't go there, though, it's an incredible website. And they also have this whole series of moving images, GIFs. So a lot of my stuff comes from the National World War I Museum. Side thought, as a historian, can I trust their, can I trust their references? Thank you, Tony. Why can I trust their references? Good. It's the National Museum. Yeah, they, they filter the, the, the fact from fiction. They've gotten down to the good stuff. It is a respected historical agency. So it's not Twitter. It's not uh, Board Panda or all the other weird stuff you guys go to. I like, the, uh, I like the National World War I Museum because I know it can be true. So what you see here, this is a machine gun. This is called a belt-fed machine gun. You see uh, many bullets flowing through the barrel at once. They're all clipped together. A marked difference from the single shot, ram it down the barrel, aim, flint lock, right? A marked difference from that. Uh, have we talked about a machine gun before? Yeah. Yeah. How? Uh, the inventor. Say it louder for the people in the back. Leonardo da Vinci. He turned to you. And he, he even turned to you and said, Leonardo da Vinci. Now, this is from Leonardo da Vinci's sketchbook. You may remember this from Leonardo <laughs> or Leonardo don't. We said that he did sketch. Uh, early representation of a machine gun. Now, not a repeating machine gun. They're not quite like that. But he was one of the forefront thinkers to come up with multiple shots at one time. Oh, be yeah, you great. see those multiple barrels welded together. He was saying, we don't have to fire one shot at a time. We fire multiple shots at a time. So he was centuries ahead of his time sketching out this machine gun. This isn't the only item, piece of technology that he was ahead on. We're going to keep talking about other things in his sketchbook as well. Another picture of the machine gun. So you can see, what do you notice about the they machine gun? They got gas masks on. Uh, they do have gas masks on. That's well, not what I'm looking for here. Good. It's got a belt fed. It is belt fed. How many people are in the picture? Two. How many, people, home. how many people does it take to operate a machine gun? Two. At least two. All right, so my take here is that to run a machine gun, it takes a crew. Crews could have been anywhere from two to six people. Machine guns very frequently had multiple parts to them. Some of them even had a little bit of a carriage that they would be wheeled on. So the point is it takes yeah. more soldiers to run a machine gun. So what is that going to do for the demand on manpower? Higher. go up. Yeah. You need more soldiers to run machine guns? Well, you need more soldiers overall. There's more than two. I see some dead people. Okay. But there's two people running the machine gun. Just another example of soldiers running the machine gun. You're going to see a variety of equipment, a variety of helmets. I do have a World War I style helmet that I'll bust out here. This is called a Brody helmet, named after its inventor. Yeah. I'll pass this around. This is, uh, this is kind of like costume level. Okay, this is not actually stopping a bullet. Now, it's pretty sturdy, but it's more like for a reenactor. So I'll pass this around, World War I style helmet. You may put it on or just pass it along, whatever you wish to do. Uh, Are hel helmets made out of Kevlar? So yeah, Kevlar is a material that is uh, light and ballistic, bulletproof, and that's what helmets are made out of today. Back then, they would have been steel, steel or uh, even iron. Iron would be very heavy. So point, here's my point here that the variety of machine guns. You can see it wasn't just cut and paste one machine gun. There's a variety of machine guns, and this is even not all inclusive. The first one, the M, the first one. Uh huh. The wheeled one. So yeah, the barrels are different, the tripods are different, the trigger mechanisms are different. They're all different. That's because it's such a new technology. There's so many different inventors trying to put their take on it. That's how we get a whole bunch of different machine guns along the way. Not the this guy is even, what do we think he's aiming at? Plane. Yeah, airplane. So uh, the machine gun rudimentary could be aimed upward and try to knock a plane oh out of the sky. When in doubt, if you didn't have any, if you didn't have any other, if you were out of vehicles, you could horse carry your machine gun. Uh, now, I don't think they were shooting off the back of the horse. Students are always like, "Oh, it's gonna shoot his head off." I think that's just how the car. Did they have like pads on them, or they just? So uh, no, they today you might look at soldiers, American soldiers, bulletproof vests and shoulder pads and knee pads and all that. This is what soldiers look like. I mean, the pictures I'm showing you is what soldiers look like. They did not very often have chest protection uh, that, you know, sometimes a guy might slap a steel plate to himself, right? But it was not widespread. It was not an issued item to all soldiers. Great question. All right, I'm moving on to tanks. Hey, I'm, I'm curious, uh, who else has already sketched about a tank that we talked about? Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, a triangular type shape uh, yeah. tank. I already told you that that was a kind of a very unique shape. Oh, yeah, that that oh, yeah. The bullets would have skipped off the side based oh, off of the uh, the angle of that. 
Uh, again, he's centuries ahead of his time. This is not the tanks that we see on the World War I battlefield. This is more representative of the tanks we see on the World War I battlefield. These early tanks had a whopping speed, a blazing speed. Oh, she's not even here. Sorry, that joke was made for her. A blazing speed of four miles per hour. I'll give y'all, like, that's like, that's like kind of an average walk. Four miles per hour. So definitely not uh, breaking any land speed records. Uh, what do you notice about the shape of the tank? It's weird. Weird. What is weird? There's things sticking out the side. Don't the thing when else has like moves? No. Like when they go. Yeah. So what is a characteristic of a tank is that it has tracks, That's not weird. wheels, but the tracks. And Kyra's exactly right. The whole track rotates, and that allows it to uh, get stuck less easily. It can go over uh, things such as trees, uh, curbs, uh, etc. You know, any debris in the way. So that's kind of the hallmark of a tank is that it has tracks like that. This is actually called, the shape is called a rhombus. Where's my math people at? Me! The shape is a rhombus. Why? Why do you think tanks are shaped like this? Because one of the, what was one of the main tactics in World War One that I told you I'm going to talk about? Trenches. trenches. They were designed, oh, this is a bad example. This is a, oh, so there are tank fails, right? There are tank fails, except it almost looks like he finishes the fall, right? It almost looks like he's going to finish the fall there. Uh, another one here. This is tanks could bridge the gap over trenches. Trenches were usually about eight feet wide, just enough for people to be inside of. A tank could bridge the gap of a trench like this right here. This is a good example right there. That's why the tanks were the shape they were. Not the way the tanks look today in the world, but at the time, they're trying to combat the trenches. Now, tanks were largely, here's another, you guys are going to laugh about this one. What do you think life was like inside of a tank? Small. Small. Very cramped. Yeah, I call this like dudes coming out of a clown car. I think there's like six guys that come out of this this video over here, and this shows all the hatches. How Very cramped. If it, so was hot, if, it was hot, if it was hot, it was hot. If it was hot, if it was cold, it was cold, and you did not have much room to maneuver. Tanks were largely in what you got into it. Oh, why is there guns on the side of them? Like turrets. So it's got a big main gun, but then it also has some side machine guns. Just makes it a uh, 360 degree killing machine. That's the, that's the whole purpose of a tank. Tanks were largely ineffective in World War I. And where's the ammo stored at? Uh, inside. Cramped and inside. Cramped and inside. I've been inside of a modern tank. I fired a, a, a tank main shell. Uh, if you're going to join the army and you want to do tanks, that's called armor. The branch is called armor. I'm an infantry officer. Infantry is the dudes that put their boots on the ground, not riding in a tank. So there's plenty of jokes about tankers always getting a ride, whereas infantry guys are always walking. Tanks were, and then here's one more benefit to the tank. You can see the power of the tank and, uh, you know, signs, road posts, just whatever. A lot of destruction, okay? Moving destruction machines. Now, something, tanks were largely ineffective in World War One. okay? They were too slow to be effective uh, to, to avoid uh, the shooting, even though they were bulletproof, uh, and the bullets would very often just kind of ping off the outside, like ding, 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 ding. But a lot of times guys broke down behind enemy lines. They drive their tank towards the enemy. They may even bridge across the trench, but they get stuck behind enemy lines. At that point, they either had to surrender, get shot out, or they're just stuck. Even if they lock themselves inside the hatch, they're just stuck. So, largely ineffective overall, but that doesn't stop humans from trying, right? Humans are always going to try to grow in technology, and that's what the tank represents. Let's talk about flight now, okay? 1903 is when the first prototype human flight airplane uh, got off the ground in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Wilbur and Oval Wright, they are Americans. They are the first humans to fly off the ground. Uh, I'm curious. Who else sketched some flying machines about 400 years before this? Here we have it again. Our man, Leonardo da Vinci, sketched flight machines. Leonardo da Vinci sketched, he did not fly. Okay, He had the idea for flight, but he never put it into action. He did not create a flying machine. So we do have the first human flight in the year 1903. World War I kicks off in the year 1914. 13 years, 13 short years later, the skies are filled with aircraft. That's amazing. That is a growth in technology. What you got? His drawings are way more complicated. Yeah, I mean, this is more representative of a helicopter, and I would say that that's even more advanced because helicopters are still 100 years away. So Leonardo da Vinci is definitely a Renaissance man, multi-talented. 
Here is a fleet of World War I style airplanes, oh, and here they are awesome. on the battlefield. Now today, if you watch an a, a airplane movie today, Navy, Top Gun, or Army, bombers, fighter jets, whatever, today planes are used for shooting. They drop bombs, or they're in their aerial attacks, and right? Today planes are used for shooting. During World War I, planes were largely not used for shooting. But what in the world would a plane be used for? Boom! Huh? Bombs. Supplies, I'll hear that. Okay. Not exactly. Distracting. Uh, observation. Planes would fly high above the sky. Yeah, maybe they got shot at. I showed you the video of the machine gun pointed to the sky. But a plane from the sky, what can he see? Everything. 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 I like that. He can see where the enemy is. Yeah. They may be able to They go in the sky. They see what's going on. They land. They come back and say, hey, they're massing in the eastern portion of the trenches. We need to attack the eastern portion of the trenches, or whatever the case may be. Planes were largely used for observation. Stephanie? Great question. Uh, many planes got shot down. Uh, sometimes they could glide to the ground and have a semi-soft landing. Sometimes they were obliterated in the sky. Uh, sometimes the pilot would not survive. Sometimes he could jump out with a little parachute and float to the ground. Uh, many crashed pilots were captured or even killed on the spot, right, by their enemy. Whichever side it was, it happened on both sides. So, good question, Stephanie. Uh, not every plane crash is the same. Some were catastrophic, uh, some were just like a slow little glide to the ground. Variety of airplanes goes to show you again, it wasn't just one what type of airplane. Uh, these are, I believe these are all British aircraft. Uh, we have French flags. No, 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 no. This is a variety of aircraft, variety of aircraft. The Americans actually didn't get involved in the aviation game. Uh, we are going to talk about American involvement a little bit later, but the war, the war starts in Europe, which I'm going to get to, I hope. Uh, here's some planes in action, and that is a duplicate. Come on. It's stuck in time. It is stuck in time. So uh, here's, a, here's the one I wanted to show you. Lar planes were largely used for observation. However, on a very, very, very rudimentary basis, you, what's going on here? The drop the bombs. Bombs. Dropping, Dropping bombs. individual bombs. How accurate is that? Very fast. Like, Oop, I hope I got him. Oop, I hope I got him. Very, very, very basic tactic. Okay, not precision, laser guided, computer track, missiles like we have today. Literally just dropping a mortar shell out the back. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. So, uh, planes were not largely used for making things go boom. They were mostly used for observation. They morph into, okay, as technology continues to advance, they morph into the type of uh, uh, thing that you think about today with a lot of shooting and dropping bombs. Moving on to, so that's the war above the sky. Here's the war under the water, submarines. Again, a rudimentary technology. A lot of people died along the way. because Can you imagine being the first person to go under sea? To go under the water, pressurized cabin. You wonder if you're ever going to make it up again? That's a brave person, brave people who pioneer these new technologies. Here is a German U-boat. They were called underwater boats, U for underwater. But of course, we would know that. We would call that a submarine. You can see kind of the cross section, very cramped again, just like the tanks. I'm not sure this one even has much of a living quarters, just a little bit. The submarine, or rather the, uh, the torpedo room, the engine room. Just a good picture of a cross section. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here is a German World War I era submarine, 35 men. To make comparison, here's from the year 2010, a much larger, uh, 64 meters versus 97 meters, 35 people versus 98 people. Just goes to show you the cramped living that it was. I'm not a Navy guy. I've never set foot on a submarine. I've not, so I can't exactly tell you what it's like. But I do know it takes a special type of person to be able to tolerate submarine living. So those people, officers or sailors who choose to be on submarines today, they're a special type of person. And I can only imagine back in 1914 the type of person that would choose to go on this type of submarine. If you're claustrophobic, that would not be the job well, for you absolutely. because you're getting in from the top, well, you're well, going well, in, well, and well, you're well, 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 uh, yep, yes. that's true. Uh, the, so Rolls Royce is a company that makes more than just cars. They actually made the uh, the engines, the nuclear reactor engines that go into this one. Great, great observation. Submarines are going to play a pretty important role 
in the war overall. Submarines were largely, they uh, they were responsible for torpedoing any ship in the water. We don't have to write this down now, I'll talk about it again tomorrow, but the Germans were torpedoing any ship that moved. Was every ship in the water a military ship? Well, what uh, what's an example of a not military ship? Fishing what would, boat. What would be on it? A fishing boat, passengers, civilians, women and children. Well, the Germans were torpedoing any boat in the water. They were trying to cut off all movement in the Atlantic Ocean, and that's going to lead to them sinking many not military ships, civilian ships. Some actually famous, rich and famous people died as a result of the German submarine warfare. So that's going to be something that draws the United States into did the they, war. Why did they go we'll talk about that at length in U.S. history. We'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow. What's your question? Why did they go through the Pacific Ocean? Because geography, mostly. <laughs> because if you were trying to go between America yeah. and Europe, you weren't going to go Pacific Ocean. Uh, yeah, too far. Yeah, uh, sometimes uh, students are like, well, how big were these things really? So this is perspective. You can see this is probably a six foot man. You can see that it's probably a pretty cramped living quarters, right? a pretty cramped vessel. And this is a German submarine that washed ashore in England after the war. Germany has lost the war. I'll cut to the chase a little bit. Germany has lost the war. England has won the war. So what are the English people doing on top of this submarine? So it's, like, it's like they're dancing on top of the submarine. Yeah, maybe stealing some of the technology. I like that thought. But they're more more—they're more like gloating. Like, ha, 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 we win, you lose. How about it? So interesting picture. I love looking. We are finally at the point of history where we have photography. For so long, I've only shown you paintings or told you what something might look like. We're finally at the point of photography. So we're going to start looking at actual photographs. All right, new technology, poison gas. Major player on the battlefield, very interesting to talk about and think about. Because of poison gas, soldiers were fitted with uh, uh, protective masks, gas masks. Liam, what you got? Uh, there was a war that uh, I think the bit, the bit, I don't think uh -huh. used. It was like guerrilla warfare, but with gas instead. Uh -huh. Yep, so gas changed the battlefield forever. It starts in World War One. The gas used in World War I was largely not fatal. Now, I'm not saying nobody died from it, but it was mostly not fatal. It was mostly an irritant. Eyes, nose, throat, lungs, respiratory. mostly a respiratory irritant. But if you saw this on the battlefield, plume of smoke coming at you, where are you going? Somewhere. The other direction. That's how gas was used in the battlefield. They would send it towards the enemy, and that plume of smoke would go towards the enemy, both sides, okay, either side that was used, and the enemy would displace. He would go in any other direction. So all of a sudden, your soldiers could follow behind the plume of smoke and uh, take over that territory. That's how the smoke was used. That's how the gas was used in World War I. Uh, this is an example of a German man mixing the gas. And, well, what is he missing? Mask. A mask of any sort. The what, if the, that way, though. what if the wind shifted? Where he died. He died. He died. And it very often did. There are stories, there are multiple stories from the war where a particular side was sending poison gas towards the enemy when all of a sudden Mother Nature shifts yeah, so the winds. You better run. And it came right back on them. So that's why it's an unreliable uh, weapon. You didn't, you never, you were reliant on the wind and you never knew if the wind was going to change or not. One more picture, and I always find this to be pretty powerful. This guy would be choking, but guess what? He got a mask around his neck. Someone's like, bro, put your mask on. Put your mask on. Uh, masks are pretty interesting. It's another piece of technology that was very new. Not all the masks look the same. This guy's obviously clowning around a little bit. You can see the eye hole. You can see the breathing tube. You can see there's enough space that what's he have on underneath? Glasses. His eyeglasses, right? There's enough space that he can still have his eyeglasses on. What is uh, missing from this mask? If you were going to be in this mask for hours and hours and hours, what would you eventually need? Air. Well, they can breathe. I mean, the air part is there. I don't know. So they drink out of water. Yeah. So there is no way to drink inside of this mask. Modern gas masks actually have a little straw tube. The gas mask that I have in the Army has a little straw tube. But these early masks had no had no way to drink. You so if you were going to be in it for hours and hours. I don't, my mask is at my, my unit. I don't take that home. But maybe maybe next time I can ask if I bring it home. Uh, just not lose it. Um, 
Early mass did not have a way to drink, so that's kind of a problem. If you're going to be in your mass for hours at a time, obviously people are going to need to keep hydrating. Please that's please a bit please. of a problem. Uh, a couple more pictures here. What do these guys have on their face? Because we're on a mask. Looks more like a corona mask, okay? We've all worn masks recently, so check this out. New technology. Not many masks were able to be made in the factories, right, since it's brand new. Nobody really knew that masks were going to be needed on the battlefield, so all of a sudden it's kind of like we're trying to build masks in the factories. In a pinch, if you didn't have a mask. A lot of people did, exactly like Aiden said, a corona-style mask. This is a cloth pad put on their face probably hooked around their ears, just like we all come through with COVID. But more than just the cloth by itself, you know what these guys have on their mask? Get your ooh face on. Uh, urine. Oh. Urine. Because they would pee on these masks and let it dry, and the ammonia that is in urine was said to be a filter for the chemicals. I honestly don't know if it's true or not. It's a science question. Maybe we have to ask Mr. McGuire. But they believe that the ammonia that would come from urine uh, you got your ooh face on. Can you imagine peeing on a mask, like a COVID-style mask, <laughs> and you're putting it on your face? Like this. So, no thanks. Even the animals got into the mix when the masks and dogs were used as messengers. Even the animals got in the act with the masks. It's pretty cool, huh? Uh, masks are still used to this day. This is from the year 1991, when American troops went into Iraq. It was a belief that Saddam Hussein, who was a crazy, evil, bad dictator, was going to use chemical weapons, much more powerful chemical weapons than were used in World War One. So a lot of U.S. troops had to wear these gas masks in the desert for days on end. Kind of hard to tell, but there is a little bit of a drinking straw like there, like I described. This is 2003, 91, 2003, same story. We go into Iraq a second time. And U.S. troops have to wear the gas mask because we didn't know if they were going to use chemical weapons. Uh, the straw thing is pretty much right there. I think it's got a little covering over it, but the straw thing is pretty much right there. This is the filter. This is the actual exhale. Obviously, there's the eye holes. The key to the mask is that it seals around your skin. It's a very tight rubber seal, and it seals around your skin. Uh, that's what keeps the, the chemicals out. Uh, if you're going to wear a mask, what's something you should probably do with it? Wash it. Washing is a great Change. thing. Change the filter. Changing the filters. How about train with it? Train to actually Maybe use on it. it. So American troops have not actually been in a chemical attack uh, in a very long time, but we still train on our masks. You don't want the moment that you need it to be the first time that you put it on, right? So here's how we train with the masks. We put ourselves in the full suit. This is me right there, 2006. Put ourselves in the full suit. This is the full suit, not just the mask. This guy's wearing just the mask. Uh, it looks like he's got the sleeves on too. But this is called the full suit, okay, mock level four. There's level one, two, three, and four. Let's put ourselves in the full suit, very hot, very hot. Unsustainable to be in a hot environment for a very long time, right? You literally pass out and die, and then how good are you? Is it hard to Well, to train in the mask, you go inside this concrete building, just a simple concrete one-room chamber. building, the gas chamber. It's called the House of Tears. Oh, what they do to you is they release you basically tear gas, okay, riot gas or crowd control gas. It's not fatal, but what it does is make you cry and snot and itch and just moan. And you go in at first with your mask on, and you're like, okay, this works. I'm good. So you know that your mask works, but to really prove it to you, you know what they do? They can take your mask off. Take it off. Or have to take it off to prove to you that it was working. Well, when you take your mask off, <laughs> all of a sudden, like your eyes are crying and your nose is snotting, and then they run you out of the house and you got to flap your arms around. Hey, and that's what you look like. Yeah. So, this is when I did the House of Tears 2006, I think. I've done it since then, but this is the one time I got a little picture of myself. Yeah. yeah. You look like that too, D1. You look like that too. Don't take your picture. You look like that too. That was my cadet baby. That's the one that said he would urinate on his mask. You do? And take oh, it. you said you do that? He would be fine with it. Prove yeah. it. Yeah. Look at your <laughs> All right, we are still on militarism. I know that uh, we're kind of still on the M because we're talking about all the technology. <laughs> Radio. Radio is a brand new technology. Previously, More you problems. had to send notes or you had to send a horse rider carrying your letter over to the next, you know, the next military fort. Well, now we're at the place where we have the technology of radio. We're going to watch Radios them. require a long line to connect radio to radio. We're not at the wireless technology just yet, okay? 
but a radial line could extend from location to location. Inside of your friendly lines, that's, that's good, right? You could communicate with each other. But given that there's a wire, what would it take to uh, cut off communications? One chop. Yeah, one little chop of the wire. So very often radios were unreliable. When they worked, it was good. But when they didn't work, obviously that led to complications. So there was a backup. You know what the backup often was? A pigeon. Literally a carrier pigeon would be used to carry messages from post to post. Where are my Harry Potter fans at? Like sending an owl? Sending an owl with a message? Anyway, carrier pigeons. So that kind of rounds out our conversation on the technologies. Uh, seeing this picture here, point out the technology you see that we just talked about. Machine gun. Machine gun. Grenade. Grenade. Flamethrower. Aviation. Yeah, we didn't talk about the blimp, but it's just another form of the aviation. What's not on here that we talked about? Communication. Okay, good. And coming from the sea? A submarine. 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 That's good. So this is all brand new technology that comes around during World War One. This next picture, going to round out the technology. I love this picture because it kind of, to me, it shows a clash of the old and the new. Some soldiers were still riding horses. Some soldiers still had old equipment like sabers, bayonets, smoothbore rifles. World War I is very often characterized as a clash between the old and the new. So you got horseback soldiers with planes in the sky, a clash of the old and the new. It's a very interesting time of swords overall. Yeah, those are long sabers. These guys hadn't caught up, right? They got old tactics connected with the new technology. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes that's right. Sometimes guys would still go over the top and run forward in mass, just like we saw in the Patriot. Well, what's a machine gun going to do to that? Move down. That, 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 that. That's right. That's right. So it's a clash between the old and the new. Let's move on to the A. Alliances. So here's what, you write, in yeah, here's what you write for alliances. An alliance is an agreement to aid someone else if attacked. Most nations had alliances, and some of them even had secret alliances. Tell me, do you have an alliance with any friend in your life? Wake up. Yes. Stand up if you can. Who you, who you got an alliance with? Can we set a name? Uh, just, okay, let's just call him John. Is it a boy? Yeah. You got an alliance with John. Yeah. If John gets hit by Jack, what you going to do to Jack? Uh, hit Jack back. Right? I'm using fake names here. My point is, you all probably have your friend group, and if someone from outside your friend group comes into your friend group and attacks a member of it, what you going to do? You're going to rally to help your friend. That's exactly what an alliance is. That's the simplest way to put it. We're not going to memorize all these countries right here, but you can see there is a blue team. That's called the Triple Alliance. There's a red team. That's called the Triple Entente, which means agreement. So there's the Triple Alliance, the Triple Agreement, but then there's also some crossover. We don't have to memorize all those years, but you can see that there's some crossover. There's some countries in the middle that touch all the sides. Guys, it's complicated. Best single word I can give you is complicated. Oh, wow. What's the purple people going The do? purple is called the Balkans. I'm going to show you that on the map here in just a second. Complicated. Just leave it to say complicated. Oh, one more. Allies and central powers. Is that on your notes? The allies is the red team here. The central powers, these are the so-called bad guys because it includes Germany. All right? Germany is going to be the bad guy in both world wars. Bad guys. Good guys. Yeah, yeah. Good guys. USA. Who's not on this screen yet? USA. That's right. Okay, I got a question. USA is going to fit into the red team in just a second. Good in Germany. Uh, I'm going to get it there. I'm going to get it there. So this is a pretty simple listing. Again, there are so many countries involved. We do not get to the point of memorizing them all. I don't want you to fret about memorizing oh, every country me. involved. But I want you to see such a long list on both sides. And tell me what Italy does. It literally changes sides. About halfway through the war, Italy leaves the Central Powers and comes to the Allied Powers. That's why, because, well, they broke agreement here, and they said, uh, don't shoot at us, we'll come over and help you. In a way, that's pretty much what happened. All right, so complicated. It all complicated. I like to think about World War One as a bar fight. Okay, you guys have never been to a bar. Maybe you guys have never been to a bar. Maybe you don't exactly know what I'm talking about, but think about it. You've probably seen a movie where one guy punches another. And then when all of a sudden his buddy comes in and punches the first guy. 
And then the dude in the corner, he didn't really want to get involved in the first place, man. Now he's got to go settle some business. It's like a bar fight. Right? I can get lengthier, but it's like a bar fight where all of a sudden, Everybody's punching, and the third, fourth, and fifth guy to get involved, they're not really sure why, but hey, because everyone else is punching, so am I. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like a bar fight. Oh, That's how World War I happened. Here is how many countries were involved. Here's how many countries were involved. You can see the alliances are also related to empires. The British Empire includes all these countries. So when Britain got involved, guess what? So did uh, India, Australia, and New Zealand. South Africa and Canada. Canada got involved. France, Belgium, Russian Empire, Italy, United States, Africa. a lot of countries got involved. Even if they weren't involved in the battlefield, some of these African nations were involved with supply routes. So North Africa was used as a landing base for airplanes and ships and supplies. That's why it's called a world war. The whole world was involved. Here's a map showing you blue for allies, red for centrals, you can see that there's not a clean front lines and back lines, right? You can see that they touch each other and they're kind of, they're, they're, they're just, everything touches everything. Blue touches red all across the map. The reason they're called the central powers is because they are generally in the center of Russia. Europe, but this is Russia right here. This is, but there's also the Ottomans over here. Complicated. Wow, Let me so give you that single word, complicated. Here is World War One, or here is Europe before World War One. We looked at this map recently. Here is where Europe after World War One. Do you see the breakup that happens? I pointed out that Ukraine is born of World War One, which is why Russia believes it has a territorial claim to Ukraine. Austria-Hungary gets all broken up. World War One is going to change the face of the planet. Countries are going to be created in its aftermath. Other countries are going to disappear because of it. Turkey, the Ottoman Empire is going to become Turkey. These countries right here are going to change their borders and get created. A uh, little less changes uh, in, in France, etc. But you see, you see how World War One affects the whole map. The Germany got, don't have to memorize all this. Just have to try to understand how it changed Europe. How it changed Europe. What's your question? Germany got chopped down. Germany yeah. did get chopped down. All right, here is, uh, here's where your coloring is going to come in. So you got the map right in front of you. you got to have three, three colors. The colors I show on the screen don't have to be your colors, but uh, uh, you can just choose three colors. So for the central powers, choose a color and color generally right here. I know the lines are a little wonky. It, you know, it doesn't have to be perfectly precise, but Germany, Austria-Hungary, Ottoman Empire, these are the central powers. Choose one color for those. Choose another color for the allied powers. Kind of got to frame them on both sides, right? If you're squeezed in the middle, like Germany, you're going to have a bad day because you got to fight to the left and to the right. Neutral is going to stay white, or if you wanted to choose another color, you could. Excuse me, you could. And then finally, I want you to do this explodey looking uh, shape for the Balkans. The Balkans are going to be called the powder keg of Europe. If you have a powder keg and you light a match, what's going to happen? Kaboom, right? Gunpowder, light a match. So the Balkans are called the powder keg of Europe. And I want you to put whatever color you choose. It doesn't have to be yellow. But put the exploding mark around Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria. This is the Balkans. These are the little countries that kick off the big war. Little countries kick off the big war. Little brother starts the fight. Big brother on both sides has to come in to finish the fight. That's how the whole world gets involved. So I'll give you a minute here to kind of do this coloring. I know it's an advisory day, so I'm going to get cut short a few minutes here. I'm trying to do as fast, trying to push as fast as I can. Trying to get to our little uh, skit. I'm going to wake you up. About one more minute. Just give it an outline if uh, if you if you can do that. Just give it an outline and then come back and fill in the colors after I move off of it. The Balkans. I bet something's about to happen in the Balkans. If you were a guessing man, Knox, did you say something's about to happen in the Balkans? Yeah. 
Don't see the guess in there. <laughs> All right, so this is the map. It's a large portion of your notes. You're kind of filling it out right now. I'm going to move on to imperialism. M-A-I. And I hang out here a lot less uh, lengthy. Imperialism is a competition for colonies. And very simply, you could describe it as uh, many smaller wars over territories. Just like we uh, had a revolution in America because we wanted to break away from England. Well, England has claims all over the world. England had claims in uh, India. England had claims in Australia. England had claims in New Zealand. So many empires wanted to expand as far as they could. Germany the same way. Germany was trying to gobble up territories. Russia the same way. Russia was trying to gobble up territories. The picture you see on the screen there shows England. The gentleman has his top hat, right? Like he's an he's a aristocrat from England. But all those arms, what does that kind of remind you of? Octopus. Okay. An octopus. And what are all those tentacles doing? Grabbing land. Grabbing what? Yeah, land. And if you can read closely, you see Egypt, India, Canada, Jamaica, uh, Gibraltar, etc. Right? So pretty descriptive cartoon showing the powerful countries, the big brothers, trying to gobble up as many little brothers as possible. This is imperialism. This is the only thing I have to say there. We did uh, most of our talking on militarism. And nationalism. Well, nationalism usually sounds nice. Usually sounds a lot like patriotism. Isn't it good to be patriotic? Isn't it good to be for your country? Patriotism says, I'm for my country. Right? Rah, rah, 4th of July, red, white, and blue, stars and stripes forever. I'm patriotic. Nationalism can be good. It can be meaning, I want the best for my country. That's good. But extreme nationalism says, my country is better than yours, and in fact, I love my country so much that I hate your country, and I love my country so much that I want to kill your people. That's extreme nationalism. It's saying, I'm the only one that's worth it. My country is so the best that the rest of y'all deserve to be to, to, to die. That's extreme nationalism. That's, that's bad. Right? That's bad. We see that in Russia. Russia is trying to have nationalism. Russia is best. Everyone else deserves to die. That, that's extreme nationalism. Well, in World War I, we see France and Germany butting heads over their border with nationalistic ideas. Ethnic nationalism in the Balkans. My country is better than your country. I'm going to kill you because of it. Patriotism, good. Right? We love our country. Nationalism, where it turns into hate, bad. So M A I and N. Militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism. These are the decades in the making reasons for World War One. Well, all of these coming together leads to the Balkan powder keg. I already described that to you, and something's gonna happen, which is gonna lead to kaboom in the Balkans. These Balkans, the countries you color, they are not allied with either side. They are the little brothers that always wants attention from somebody bigger than them. And this is the stage that we find ourselves on for the immediate cause of World War I. I'm going to give you these real quick and then we're going to act it out. Super fast, we're going to act it out. So the immediate cause of World War I is the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, he was next in line to be on the Austria-Hungarian throne. So in a day, they didn't have elections, right? It's not like they had a vice president. He was the son of the king, which means he's next in line to be on the Austrian-Hungarian throne. Austria-Hungary has claims in Serbia. Some Serbians are okay with that. Yay, thanks for taking care of us. Other Serbians are like, fooey on that. We want to have independence. Well... And a Serbian terrorist, okay, a Serbian nationalist terrorist, assassinates Archduke Franz Ferdinand. You see the picture here? This young man assassinates the Archduke and his wife. Because of this, all the Allies jump in. One shot, one kill. You might say, isn't this just between Austria and Serbia? How come they can't just deal with their problems by themselves? Because of the alliances? Because of the nationalism? Because the imperialism and the militarism, all the allies jump in. Newspaper heading there, you see that the heir to the throne has been slain. His wife was also killed, so it was two murders. And because of this, all the allies start to jump into the war. 
I'm going to show you the domino effect here in a second. But I want to show you, first I want to act this out. we got to do it real fast. So I'm just going to call up a couple of people. I'm not going to spin the wheel. Hope nobody gets offended. Uh, I'm, not, I'm just picking the first people I see, all right? Cast of characters, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Righteous, come on up. Righteous, you're the Archduke. We play? You want to play? Hey, come on up. You want to play? Want to shoot a Nerf gun or not? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Here you go. You're the Archduke. Aiden is the Archduke. I need, I need a wife for him. Let me shoot. Maddie, Ma Mimi, him. be the wife. Come on up. Mimi's the wife. Come on up. Come on up. Oh, no. Oh, no. Come on up, Mimi. You're his wife. His wife is named Sophia. This is the Aiden is you. This is the Archduke. So you got a stash like that? You kind of do. You kind of do. This is Archduke Franz Ferdinand. This is his wife, Sophia. Mimi, come on up. Come on up. Come on up. You two are in the car. You two are in the car. So oh, I got to shoot him. I need a driver. Isaac, you're a driver. Isaac's a driver. Hey. All right. Hang on. This is the setup. Archduke, wife, driver. Driver, you get a little hat hat. Uh -oh. Does that fit? Okay. They are going on a parade. They're waving. They're blowing kisses. They're trying to make nice with the Serbian people. Hey, we're here to take care of you. We're here to serve you. Well, I told you that some Serbians did not like them. This is one of them. His, this man's name is Gavrilo Princep. He's 19 years old. Come on up, Knox. Knox wants to play. Knox, you're Gavrilo. Oh, shoot. I Not yet. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to direct this play, all right? I need one more hey, terrorist. Hey. Liam, come on up. Liam is also a member of this terrorist group called the Black Hand. You see that little inset picture there? This is the group of assassins who sets out to attack Archduke Franz Ferdinand on that day. Here's another picture of Gavrilo. This is the cast of characters, all right? Driver, Archduke, and his wife. Assassin number one, and then assassin number two, this is Gavrilo. You're cocked. You got this a hand grenade, all right? Here's the story. Here's how it goes. I need you two to go off into the corner right there. I'm going to direct this play, and I think you'll understand it when I'm done. Archduke, Franz Ferdinand, wave. Wife, wave. You all are Serbians. Say, hey, we're here to take care of you. What's up, y'all? What's, What's up, y'all? We're here to take care of you. Drive, drive, driver, drive. As they're driving, pause, these guys are planning to assassinate them. You hate them. You see them as taking over your country. You don't want any part of that. So you are the black hand. Okay, that's your group name. You're the black hand. You got a gun. You got a hand grenade. Let's see how this goes. You're driving. You're driving. You know what? Take a lap around the room. Go back to the door. Make a turn. 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 Come back this way. You're on parade. Super slowly. Super slowly. Wave. Grenade man. Come on frag up. Frag out. Yeah, frag out. Frag out. Oh. Keep driving. Keep driving. Keep driving. Liam, what did you forget? I don't know. He forgot that the grenade has a 10 second delay on it. So drive, 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 drive. Boom. This grenade blows up. No, stop. This grenade misses the car. It misses the car. Oh. Liam throws the grenade, but he misses the car. Now they know they're under attack. So speed off. Speed off to the door. The grenade is thrown. It hits the car behind them. Okay? So oh, it doesn't totally miss, miss, but it hits the car behind them. Liam, Rat. you are so distraught that you're a failed, failed terrorist. You know what you do? It takes a cyanide caplet. Cyanide is supposed to kill you. It's a little poison that's supposed to kill you. Liam, you know what? You got some outdated cyanide. It doesn't kill you. It only gives you a bad stomachache. So have a bad stomachache. Ooh. Because you got a bad stomach ache, you still want to kill yourself, right? You want to get out of here. You want to kill yourself. He goes, this is a true story. He goes and jumps off a bridge. Jump. He jumps off a bridge. But you know what you jump into? A water. A river that's four inches deep. Do you die in a four inch river? No, you don't. Know. So he gets arrested. This is a true story. This is a failed terrorist. He gets arrested and goes off to jail. Go to jail. Go to jail. Knox, you got your gun? I'm ready. Knox, you got your gun. Hey, I can hold both of those. Hang on a sec. Actually, you do need two guns. Behind you. That's right. One shot each. One shot each. Yeah, Brilo is so ticked off at his party. He's like, I am friends with a bunch of doofuses. I'm so angry that this assassination attempt didn't work. Well, Gavrilo, so Gavrilo's angry. You know what you do when you're angry? I shoot people. He goes to a sandwich shop. You're what? so angry, you go to a sandwich shop. You go to a sandwich shop. Uh, just stand, Knox, just stand right here. Stand right here. Knox, right here. Just stand right here. Actually, come right here. I want you to be on the video. All right. There you are. There you are. So I'm vegan. Right there. There. You see yourself? Yeah. Wave. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so these vegan. guys, these guys, they speed off. <laughs> But he wants to resume the parade. He wants to show he's not scared of the assassins. They resume the parade. But in resuming the parade, he does say, the driver, driver, come on front, 
takes a wrong turn. You know where the wrong uh, turn takes them? To the cafe. To right by the sandwich shop. So as they're coming yeah. by, no. Gabriela Princep sees his opportunity. Walking down and the he street. says, is this possible that they are coming right up to me? Gavrilo approaches the vehicle and shoots dead. Don't shoot him in the face. Shoots dead, boasts the archduke. And he's I lied. Die, 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 speed off. And see. Alright, it's going super fast there because I know we're coming up on the end of class. Uh, claps for all of our participants. Claps for all of our participants. Okay, you're undead. Undead. You're undead. You're undead! Oh, I had a duck. I had you right in place. Thank you, Steve Foreman. Let me finish this out. I know it's not a story. Here are the steps that made the world go one. Because of this shooting. Beautiful, Barry. He did miss. He straight missed. Yeah. You do Good. 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 about it if they remember anything at all have a family conversation about it i'll post a couple links to google classroom like i always do thought we had a very good day tomorrow we'll continue with world war one clap for yourself clap for yourself clap for yourself you did miss mimi mimi you're still up why don't you push me down mimi got straight